Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening for a conversation with Lee Vandervu and Reich Longest about Lee's book, As the World Burns, The New Generation of Activists and the Landmark Legal Challenge Against Climate Change. My name is Talia and I'm the events manager here at Flyleaf. We have some exciting programming coming up this season. Next week, we're hosting Nashville-based author Ed Tarkington for his new novel, The Fortunate Ones, about Southern wealth and grandeur. Then the following week, we're welcoming Thomas Healy for his book, Soul City, which is an account of the effort to build a racial utopia in rural North Carolina in the 70s. If either of those books and events sound interesting to you, I encourage you to check out our Crowdcast profile at the top of your screen if you click where it says Flyleaf Books to see the full lineup and register for any events that you're interested in. If you'd like to support Flyleaf and our guests, please keep in mind that As the World Burns is available from the store. We are currently closed for browsing, but you can order online or over the phone. If you've already bought a copy of the book, but you, sorry, my spirit popped up. I uh, thought I was talking to her. <laughs> um, if you've already bought a copy of the book, but you'd like to support the store, you can donate a few dollars to fly through Crowdcast. There's a donate button at the bottom of your screen, and that enables us to continue offering virtual events. Without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce our guest tonight. Lee Vandervu is an award-winning investigative and environmental journalist whose work has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, and The Guardian, among others. Her 2016 book, The Fish Market, which chronicles the gentrification of the sea in the name of sustainable seafood, won an Oregon Book Award for general nonfiction. Her new book, As the World Burns, focuses on the young people who have sued the federal government over climate change. Tonight, we will be in conversation with Reich Longest. Reich is the director of the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic and, an, and a clinical professor of law at the Duke University Law School. Among other achievements, he has worked with youth activists to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from power plants in North Carolina. All right, to keep the focus on our guests, I'm going to minimize my screen and let them talk to each other about the book and their work. If you think of a question you'd like to ask Lee and Reich, you can leave it in the chat or use the ask a question feature at the bottom of your screen. I'll pop back up at the end of the event to read those questions out loud and to um, moderate conversation between our guests. Reich and Lee, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was really looking forward to this discussion when we first um, set up this time. And then this week uh, seemed like it was a very appropriate time to have this discussion maybe even more so than perhaps any other week we could have had it before, uh, at least in this month. And, uh, but I really wanted to focus as much as we could possibly on this particular book and, and the moments that it chronicles and also your approach to writing what is a very interesting uh, book that interweaves a story of people, this Juliana 21 and this case. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to pull off, to pull together the story of people but also deal with the complexities of uh, litigation. And lawsuits can be quite dry to, to describe in, in writing. So I wanted you to start uh, for us, if you wouldn't mind, just tell us a little bit about your background as an environmental journalist and, and your interest in ecology and environmental science a little bit. Sure. Um, well, I've, I've been a journalist for a long time. I live in the Pacific Northwest, so uh, environmental journalism is kind of a natural fit for the region that I'm in. But I mean, what I like about it is I would say most of my work really revolves around this question for society and systems about who benefits and who pays. Right. You know, um, and that's been everything from, you know, government accountability for running the sewer system to police accountability stories. But what works really for me with environment is I feel like it combines some of the most important questions for ordinary people, you know, people who are outside of civic life and also um, really brings in the broader, of course, ecological questions and landscape questions that are, I think, culturally closer to us than we often think. And most of the environmental work that I've written without fail has involved some of the most interesting characters that I've ever worked with. So 
I really like just being outside with them and being in, in their worlds and in their landscapes and learning about who they are as people and where they come from. And um, it just uh, maybe started somewhere and kept going. <laughs> what was it about the plaintiffs in this case that drew you to them and to their story? Honestly, um, you know, it was such a spectacle. So this is going back now to 2018. I'm a journalist. I'm living in Oregon. Um, this case was filed in the Ninth Circuit Court of, of um, Oregon. So it was taking place just a couple hours to the south of me, and I was getting a lot of information about it. You know, mm -hmm. sooner or later, if you're a journalist, everybody learns your email. So I was getting like bombarded with uh, developments in this case, and I just kept scratching my head about it. Like I, I knew like sort of the this billboard sticker kind of um, things that most people knew about it. Twenty one young people suing the federal government over climate change, and it just kept staying like it seemed like a publicity stunt to me initially and it had after months and months of this some real staying power and I just started to look at it and be like this is for real and and who are these people and what do they what do they want what are they asking for and the youngest plaintiff was eight years old so I had questions about like does an eight-year-old really understand like the case for the environment and can he articulate it and what's his family like how do you get these values and and like, are these kids really like deeply committed to this cause? Are they being stage managed by the adults? Like who's leading this? So I was just like really intrigued and tempted to, to dive in. Well, that, that's, that's, that explains a lot about your interest. But, you know, anytime anybody undertakes to write a book, as I understand it, I've, I've never written one, but as I understand it, it's quite a daunting task. Um, you have to find the time, you have to find the support to make it happen. So how did you go from having interest in the people and interest in these questions and then turning that actually into the process that allowed you to write this book? Well, it was a little bit of a lark in some ways. I mean, I just initially had this curiosity about the case and the plaintiffs. I applied for grant support and my intention was to go to um, visit the plaintiffs in the regions that they came from, because they do come from all over the United States. They're not just from Oregon, although half of them are. They represent um, communities in the Pacific um, Islands, in Florida, in New York, in Alaska, uh, from the Navajo Nation. So like, there's a really broad swath and a lot of environmental uh, questions there. So I got a grant from the Society of Environmental Journalists to go meet them, get to understand what the issues were, report on climate change in the regions and get to know them and their families a little bit. And the idea was that this was preparation for trial coverage. So their trial was set to begin in October of 2018. Um, the trial never happened. And, and if you know some things about the case, then you know that the reason it didn't happen was because the Trump administration deployed some some pretty nuclear legal tactics with regard to this case and four other cases close to the president's agenda at the time. Yeah. Um, I had meanwhile relocated to uh, Springfield Eugene area to cover the case. I was in town, all the plaintiffs were there, all the experts were there. This, this thing was 11 days from trial and we found out basically like a couple days before that it was for sure not going to happen. So everyone was just hanging around wondering what to do. And I just thought, I'm covering this, but I don't know what the story is anymore. And just started following them through the next year of, of mm -hmm. what, what happened in the case. And through that time, you know, my own sense of uh, maybe outrage, you know, to watch 21 kids um, really miss what should have been their day in court just because of the way that the government was handling them. I felt like what didn't happen in this case was just as important, if not more important than what had happened in the case. So I have an agent because I've written a book before. I approached her with an idea to, um, to, to write about this kind of non-event and, and the important question really of, um, you know, whether young people have a right to, to a sustainable climate and whether we were as adults going to answer it or just be culpable 
in, in plodding along in this rigid, kind of ridiculous trajectory that this yeah. thing got on in yeah. the case. That's so, um, it, you know, the, the book sold and it was nine months to the finish line. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. Well, the, the, the stories that you were able to collect and clearly the experiences that they're relaying make for some really compelling reading. And I just wanted to know if you if you wanted to share any of those um, stories with us. I mean, some of them are just truly visceral um, images and to have young people relating those and then you um, telling their stories using their own words it, is quite compelling. So I wondered if you wanted to share with us some excerpts of some some of the stories uh, and maybe share those with the with all of us so that you can um, share with us some of your favorite excerpts, if you wouldn't mind, on those points. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you you kind of hit it on the head there. These stories are infused with a lot of emotion. There's nothing quite like, you know, having like a, a kid who's 11 years old just be like, I feel like the government just, you know, doesn't really care about me. Like, mm -hmm. say that to, you know, being the adult in the room on this thing is tough at times. And so this was one of the first stories that I heard. This is um, from Jaden Foytlin, who's in um, Louisiana. In the morning, I'd first encountered Jaden in her bedroom, purple, after I found my way down a dark hall of her pink house. Jaden's older sister, Erin, a few minutes awake, was flopped onto the bed under a pastel comforter, and Jaden was at her desk, the wall above it covered in watercolors and drawings. Jane was friendly and talked about her activism and her art and her love for aeronautics, told me how captivated she is by planets and how she hopes to one day study science. She said the planet that used to have was the room which I put away. The reference was the flood was the flood large and large, so I asked Jane to tell me about the floods, especially the flood in 2016, and her expression darkened. Here's what she said. I woke up at like three, somewhere in the a.m., because my older sisters, Erin and Grace, were knocking on my door and telling me to wake up, wake up, and that water was coming through the house. Of course, I thought I was dreaming because I was like, why the hell would water be coming through? I was kind of thinking, what do they want? I thought they were just trying to make me come out of my bed with some excuse or something. They weren't. Jaden sat up. She swung her legs to the floor and stepped in the water up to her ankles. The house was a ranch on a slab, an L-shaped building with the longest length re reaching deep into the backyard. Jaden was at the end of this stretch, in a room with a door to the yard, and outside, it was raining hard. She walked toward her sister's voices in the hallway, opened the door to find them there, and as she did this, pulled the door toward her, water rushed from her room into the rest of her home. I was like, oh, that's my fault, oh my God, why did I open the door, she said. Elsewhere, water had been rising through the cracks in the foundation, soaking the carpeting. Sewage and old water rose in the toilets and in the bathtubs. But until then, most of it was in Jaden's bedroom with Jaden, slowly leaking in from under the door. The sewage had the worst smell in the world. It was so nasty, she said. My family ended up getting sick. A lot of my neighbors ended up getting sick. Jaden's brother, Dylan, her sister, Grace, and Grace's boyfriend went to the police station, but no one could help much just gave them a few sandbags to block the doors while the water rose. It wasn't enough. So next they used all the blankets, then the towels. So much water, they were no match for it. They gave up and focused on the electronics, on unplugging everything, worried about electrocution and trying to save what could be saved. Drawings and photos were lost anyway. Jaden's bedroom dissolved in the lake of her room. Jaden's bed frame, sorry, dissolved in the lake of her room. Her brother's toys were next. When I asked how much the water rose, she pointed to a watermark on the wall about two feet above the floor. I hate that flood so much, she said. That event was, uh, you know, it's not really very well known, um, but it was the nation's worst natural disaster since Sandy. It, it dumped seven trillion gallons of water uh, on, on Louisiana, and to put that in perspective, it was like three times the amount of rain that fell during Katrina. And this kind of torrential rainfall has been tied to climate change, and it's increasingly a problem in Louisiana and, and other parts of the Southeast. When you think about 
children having to live through this and experience this, the range of emotions that you've laid out in that passage, going from thinking that she's being pranked by her siblings uh, to the growing realization of horror and then how everything sort of turns upside down on her. I mean, the toilet's supposed to flush one way, right? That's, we, we right. are, all of our expectations about waste management are that you flush the toilet, the bad stuff goes out, the sewage and, and stuff goes out. And then to have the flood reverse literally everything about that so that you're being surrounded by not just the frightening specter of being surrounded by water, but water that's contaminated with every possible um, nasty thing, everything that we've disposed of, whether it be gas or oil, whether it be sewage, chemicals from different chemical plants, all of that stuff becomes a big soup. And she and her family are exposed to that soup. And so are so many others in that region. It really is, it's, it's quite, it's quite staggering. One thing about the book, you really do talk about some of these you know, terrible specific situations that the youth have found themselves in. And what I like about that is it's sometimes it can be numbing to members of, to my students or to members of the public when we start cataloging, you know, how many different disasters were in excess of large number thresholds in terms of dollars or lives lost and how many of those have been right. in many years. And, you know, the, even some of the graphs that graph temperature that can be fairly, um, dry it's important i mean it tells us trends and it actually gives scientific fact but getting that visceral story in there was really really compelling and it's not the only one you've got several others in there as well um what do you think is the importance of connecting together that the the story element the human element of being confronted with this with the bigger picture question of science because there, there clearly is an environmental journalism and environmental um, writing like this a need to connect this with some science and, and you do that but I, I wanted to ask you how, how do you how do you how do you as an author balance those approaches yeah well i think the storytelling part is really important i mean i think you know facts hit us up here and story hits us right here right yeah. like this is how we connect with other people this is how we care and we choose whether or not we're going to act and and i wanted people to have the experience that i had meeting these plaintiffs and it wasn't just like their stories broke my heart although that was true often but also their impressive resilient determined people um incredibly accomplished for their ages you know there's a lot of really great things in this tale and i feel like that makes it more accessible too um yeah I mean, how to do it, I think, was I just kind of put a lot of thought in. And I think if you're if you're covering the climate movement and you understand the issues, then you know what's in the way and you know what the main tenets of like articulating the problem are. And I tried to just think about, you know, which of the plaintiffs best expressed and explained those things and ordered the book kind of conceptually around their stories in that way. Um, when I meet people, I, I record everything and I take tons of pictures. So I always have a good record, but the thing that I do, that's probably the most important is I leave that experience and I give myself some time. Um, I, maybe it's an airplane ride, maybe it's a hotel room. Um, but I just really write my impression of, um, you know, what the experience was, not just the story, not just the facts, not just what they told me, but really try to get that writing out that um, I feel like does hit people here, you know, yeah. really to describe the the flavor of the experience and the funny moments and the, and the not so funny moments. Um, and that's the writing that I was doing in the, in the summer when I was meeting them and I was thinking, this is going to be part of my trial coverage. Um, and it ended up just landing in the book in this really, I think, kind of raw way. But the, some of the power is the nature of it being raw. I mean, it, there's clear, it's clear that you've, you've clearly edited down a lot of material in order to get to the meat of the story here. But that the, the rawness of it comes through. Um, I've only met out of this group of plaintiffs personally two of the individuals that you've profiled in here. I've spent more time and had more conversation um, 
with Kelsey Juliana than any of the others. I actually got a chance to serve on a panel with her a few years back. Um, and uh, but um, I've had a chance to see um, Shuta's Kat uh, perform uh, when he was much younger. And that was really um, inspiring and very uplifting. You know, there's something about his presence on stage when he's performing. There's a sense of joy. There's a sense of power. You know, it's like he's taking he's taking the stage, he's taking the microphone, and he's saying to the world, I've got something to say. And I'm excited that you all are here to listen to me. It was not gloom and doom at all. Um, and, it, you know, I think one of the things that I really liked about this book, too, is that even people who've not had those opportunities, and I've only had, like I said, those out of the 21, those are the only two that I've met thus far, um, to really get a sense of, their ability to really inspire others and also their um, keen passion in working, not just on this work, but on other things that make their communities better, that build their families up, that take care of issues in their in their homes. One of the ones that really struck me in the book was the story about the, 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 the horses um, and the farm. Um, that was just a really, really heart heart wrenching one. And uh, and yet I also know that that's a story in part about resilience, right? It's about the, the resilience of that community. Um, and, and when you're thinking about balancing the pieces of the, of the story of these stories of, of resilience and harm, um, is there anything that you, any part of the book that you really liked about the way in which it discussed the case? Cause I, I personally think writing about cases is very difficult, um, as a law professor, um, you know, doing it all the time, uh, it's hard to really find good ways to talk about cases. When Hollywood tries to take even a true life case, you know, they have to make all kinds of tricks to actually make it interesting as a matter of narrative, because especially when we're talking about things like pretrial and discovery, you know, the main key aspects in many ways of a case that are things that the public doesn't really typically see just very hard to make that interesting on the other hand it is an interesting process at least for those of us who are you know interested in sort of the detective story aspect of what we do as 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 lawyers i wondered if there was some some part of that of this in terms of the case itself that you really wanted to share with us and maybe read a read an excerpt if you've got any or at least just describe one yeah um wonder if which is better I you know I'll, I'll read you something I haven't actually read this before so we'll see how it goes okay. one of the things that I like about this particular case is it didn't it didn't need for me to massage you know too much into like narrative devices um, yeah. it just has a very natural it's naturally strange uh, the people in it are, are naturally interesting. And and also, so is Donald Trump. I mean, as a character, <laughs> and it, you know, it, that's the thing. I mean, Donald Trump, there's, there's a reason why the media is, like, captivated by him. And he is just a very uh, it's excellent subject in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. Forgive me, I haven't read this before, and so I, I'm just looking for my page here. Um, okay, here we go. I'm describing the case just being called off. Mm, yeah. Um, <clears throat> The, the, essentially what's happening here in the world is that, um, you know, uh, Parkland shooting has just happened. Uh, Black Lives Matter is becoming a thing. Standing Rock has, has also just happened. And there's this media environment and I'm, I'm discussing that. And, uh, and the fact that did, Big names like Ellen DeGeneres are already pushing the news through their channels, signaling an upcoming media pylon. Nearly every teen glossy and trendy digital news magazine has had at least mention of the case, if not a profile of a plaintiff or a write-up of the litigation. And once these outlets are on the bandwagon, they tend not to stray. Briefs and updates 
tidbits of legalese in anticipation of the next, which means that if SEO and social media are about to be as weaponized as the amicus brief, the case could be propelled on stage and on screen in ways that even Johnny Cochran, master of the courtroom media spectacle, could never have fathomed. <laughs> Daily news outlets and wire services are already betting on it big with Reuters, that's me, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and others planning trial coverage that includes extended stays in Eugene and a healthy dose of pre-trial jockeying for space inside the courtroom. The documentary crew has also been following the plaintiffs for years, recording what is likely to be history one day. And for the Our Children's Trust podcast, several of the plaintiffs are carrying USB recorders, memorializing their daily thoughts to a team of audio producers. Now, the news cycle is poised to dive into the case. And in these ways, the Juliana 21 have the perfect luck of both timing and age. Most are too young to vote, and they filed their case against the Obama administration, not Trump both facts that mostly quiet the charge that they are politically motivated. That they are too heartfelt, too real, too young to smack in public is just a bonus. In a few short weeks, the media will turn its bright eye toward them and the stage will be theirs. And so I kind of go on to talk about how Shutescott created a meme in which Donald Trump was loving his new album and saying, Shutescott's album is so hot. Oh, it's fire. <laughs> it almost makes me believe in climate change. A lot of people <laughs> fell for this, right? And I fell for yeah. it first until I asked him about it. But it was like one of these things that really could have happened in this environment. So to the extent that I could kind of grab onto these bizarre externalities and like throw them into the situation, I think it made the, the legal parts of it a little more um, palatable. Yeah. And, it, you know, it was a very it's been a very weird four years um, for journalists, for those who work in environmental law, um, the level of upheaval, the level of um, of churn um, and the level of uh, of, as you say, sort of media scrutiny of various kinds on different different aspects of this at different times have been, has been quite extraordinary. Um, I really, I really did like the way that you, that you covered that aspect in the book as well. And also one of the things is maybe a side, I'm not sure if it's a side effect or if it's a cause and effect aspect, but one of the things that kind of comes through clearly too are the ways in which um, adults and others have been sort of telling these youth, oh, you're the last hope that we have, you know, it's all up to you so glad that you've sort of come here and there's an element of that that's sort of disempowering in a, in a way maybe laying way too much on these youth and, and also there's an element i think of how do these youth manage to keep themselves sane you know how do they keep how do they keep themselves going and one of the things that i really also liked about some of the portraits in here are discussions about some of the other outlets that they have so like Kieran Ullman's um, band with the wonderful name and, and all of the different music uh, that he has going on. That was a really interesting anecdote, I thought, as well. Um, I wanted to know, did, what was your sense of the frustration, uh, frustrations that the students, that the youth were having with the coverage? And then also, you know, how were they cultivating uh, an inner life? Uh, cultivating, you know, things that could energize them and get them through the spectacle that you described. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, they they understand. I mean, I don't want to speak for, for all of them or really for them at all, but in, in conversations like that I've had with them, there does seem to be a certain familiarity and um, appreciation for the fact that media exposure for their case was a good thing. And, you know, as it increasingly turned into this, like, unending delay, I think that some of the youth, um, and I do write this in, in, in Kieran's scene at one point, that, like, really started to come away with a feeling of, like, if we win the culture war, maybe that's our, our achievement here. Maybe we're not going to get in the courtroom. Maybe we're not going to win there. But really being able to look toward the amount of attention that they were getting as like something that had really moved this issue, you know, much further into the mainstream than mm. it had been before. And I think that's really true. I mean, I don't know that we would have seen, uh, you know, a photo shoot about a climate plaintiff in Vanity Fair 
in any other equation, right? Um, yeah. But this is, you know, there are, these plaintiffs were on 60 minutes. Um, I mean, they did this in, in incredible things. And yet I think um, for them that that the media spotlight and all the attention um, is, is not necessarily like a place of solace. I think that they seem to find a lot of um, comfort in one another and the unique shared experience that they're having. Right. And that a lot of that is really private. Um, and that they do take time to be themselves and be away from this and be separate from it and be interested and engaged in all the other things that they want to do with their lives. And I think you have to have a very supportive family to be a plaintiff in a federal lawsuit. And I found a lot of the parents to be supportive and helping um, the, at least the younger plaintiffs maintain a, a life that um, was not all trial and spectacle. It was, you know, taking care of, of, uh, you know, your homework and yeah. <laughs> uh, horse riding lessons and, <laughs> you know, being involved in the arts and doing other things um, outdoors with your family that are nothing about this. So there's, there was a lot of balance there too. That's a really good point that the focus has been so much on the youth themselves, but there are obviously other people who are supporting them here. Julia Olson being one of the people that also is, is, is a character in this story really central in so many ways. Um, and there are others obviously who've been supporting and working um, uh, in the communities around each one of these youth and then in their immediate um, family and friend circles as well. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the uh, impact of this work on uh, a, lawyer, a young lawyer like Julia Olson, who is really, you know, dedicated now years and years of her life um, and fighting incredible odds against some of the um, largest law firms in the nation and some of the biggest companies in the nation who had you know, intervened initially in this case back when it was brought during the Obama administration. And then, lo and behold, once Trump was elected, the advantage of intervention turned into tremendous disadvantage, technically. Um, but nevertheless, at all cases, um, here you have this, this, this group of youth and their legal team facing off against some of the heaviest hitters in the legal world on the defense side. Um, and again, like you said, it went from Obama to Trump and, and the Trump administration's approach to things was very different. Might be useful at this point just to get a sense from you. What, what do you think was the biggest shift between the Obama administration's Justice Department approach to this and say the Trump administration's um, Justice Department and their defense on this case? Yeah, I think the biggest shift in the case overall was that um, prior to Trump becoming president, it was the fossil fuel energy industry that really fought this case. They sought standing in it. They got it in 2015 and they began very aggressively trying to push it out of the courts. Um, when Trump became president, that changed and, and maybe not just for that reason, um, but also at that time, a lot of energy fossil fuel companies were becoming subject to discovery. Um, and you had some, some pretty high ranking folks who suddenly they're in, they're in the Trump cabinet, but they were previously in this, you know, this fossil fuel company. So there was potential for Giuliano to start really rifling through like all the manila folders and all the places. And that was not uh, palatable, I think for folks in industry. So they withdrew and the opposition to the case, um, not to say that the o Obama administration didn't defend against it because they did, you know, right. in all the standard ways, but the Trump administration was much more aggressive in its defense uh, against the case after that point. And it went, um, I mean, they were really throwing the kitchen sink at it, but probably the most noteworthy thing to say is that um, uh, the person who became the head of the environmental section 
at Department of Justice under Trump was a longtime BP attorney who had spent many, many years settling claims on the Deepwater Horizon spill and had a kind of a, a nasty track record um, for his manner of dealing with people there, um, gave a, a talk about um, to the Federalist Society about how he thought climate uh, regulation or carbon regulation of any kind was a socialist power grab for the top tiers of the economy, like really, really anti-climate change and remediation. And he personally took on uh, defending this case. And some of the behavior was was shocking. Um, there was a hearing in uh, June of 2019, in which, I mean, it, it, you have to imagine the scene. I mean, there are so many young people for whom this case is about them. That right. court was absolutely packed. There was another overflow room, absolutely packed. And there was a park across the street that was full of people just trying to get a glimpse of like these plaintiffs and another park down the road that the plaintiff's attorneys had rented so they could broadcast the hearing into the park because there were that many people that were interested in seeing this happen. And they were all kids, mostly, not all, of course, but largely, right. largely kids. I have never been in a courtroom so packed with young people. So the energy around this on behalf of the youth was huge. And here you have a Trump administration attorney kind of arguing that this isn't the government's role. And a judge gave him a hypothetical. He said, well, say rogue Canadian kidnappers are coming across the border and they're kidnapping children and they're taking them back to Canada and they're killing them. Do they have a, you know, do those kids have an opportunity to go to the court and say, I would <laughs> stop this. The state isn't yeah. doing anything. The federal government isn't doing anything. And the government's attorney stood there and argued, no, for the sake of constitutional design, a few unlucky kids are going to have to die by the hand of rogue Canadian kidnappers so that the, you know, our, our structures can all be protected. That was the government's argument in front of these hundreds of kids. It did not sit well. Yeah, it's been an interesting dynamic. I would say that the... Um you probably would say that that would be true in any number of other examples of government inaction for it wouldn't have to just be fossil fuel interests that there's a fairly well established long term project of the Federalist Society's intellectual elite and their and their adherence towards really, really pushing this notion of limiting the jurisdiction of the federal courts. And, uh, you know, we, we often refer to that in, in law school, we talk about, we, 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 we use the term standing as one, of the, as one of the components of it. There are constitutional dimensions to that. There's structures in the United States Constitution that lay out what the judicial power is. And there's statutes in place that lay those out as well. And so that's been one of the places on which people who have been opposing Juliana have been really pushing and, and essentially in uh, in a non legal technical argument, they're basically going to say it's judicial overreach. This is an example of, you know, activist courts run amok. We can't let you know one uh, judge in a district court in Oregon bring the United States government to its knees. On the other hand, there really is a lot to be said for the notion that there probably is that a, any given federal judge within their jurisdiction is also one of the most powerful. Uh, federal officials in terms of what they have a right to do within their sphere. So the real question becomes what is fundamentally because what is the right sphere? I did host a um, about an hour long lunch program. I think it was before the pandemic where we had um, uh, Jed Purdy and Ernie Young who are on the faculty of Duke debate this uh, discussion at the time. And Professor Young explained, you know, the concerns like what you heard from the Trump administration. So this is this is a fairly common complaint. The question I had at the end of it is, at the end of the day, is the if, if the Constitution is a social contract, can we have a social contract that is ultimately sociopathic? I mean, is there not some limit, if you will, on our social contract that that there is a limit there? Now, figuring out what that limit is and then figuring out how do you turn that into a manageable case for a district court judge 
you know, those are all questions, but the idea that it's judicial overreach to tell the government that they need to um, protect the youth, um, it do, does seem to me to be, you're, all you're doing is you're asking the sovereign to be the sovereign. We, we've decided that as a people that we've made the government sovereign, right? That's our choice. We've given it to them. And we're asking them to step up to that responsibility. So that seems to me to be the, the you know, the other, the counterpoint to that argument about limited jurisdiction. Um, but it does, you know, it, it's still up in the air, right? We have the, um, we have a, a 2-1 decision, the epilogue of your book, um, you know, ends on the note of the 2-1 decision. Uh, the dissent in that decision was very vigorous. Uh, and now, of course, we're still waiting to hear what the Ninth Circuit is going to do with that with that case. So um, I did want to check with you just to make sure if there was another aspect of the book that I haven't asked you about before we start thinking about taking questions or another excerpt that you wanted to share with everybody. I wanted to make sure that we gave you plenty of time to do that. And, uh, you know, maybe there's a question I, I always like to ask people, what's a question I didn't think to ask you that I should have asked you? And maybe that's a way of saying what you'd like to say. Uh, you know, I think these questions are great. I just, um, you know, I, the, apart from the fascinating question of what the courts do with this, I think like the moral question of what we should be doing with it is really, is pretty clear. And, it, you know, even though I'm a journalist and I am uh, tend to, to come to things really impartially, I mean, there's, there are moments when you also have to choose to be on the right side of history. And Hmm. So this was an interesting project for me in that way that it, it tested me to kind of get out of the usual, like he said, she said, and write myself into the book and the perspective that I had as an older person, you know, confronting this question with with kids. And um, yeah, so, you know, it was a great it was a great experience. And um, these questions have been really good. I'm very happy to take others from from the audience. Sorry, just okay. <laughs> I was headed. Um, okay, if anybody has any questions um, that they would like to ask either Rug or Lee about these cases, about the book, um, I do have a quick question uh, that I was just thinking about listening to your conversation. Um, so I know that you focused in Oregon um, and you said half of the plaintiffs are from Oregon and then half are, I guess, from other places, how would you, how do you feel that um, the location that people were, that the, these kids or young people were based in affected um, the the social reaction to them, if, if it had one? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, hugely, you know, it, the reaction to climate change is really cultural. Um, and there definitely are some red state plaintiffs that have a, a, a very, um, different experience, I think, um, in, in being plaintiffs in the case um, than, than their blue state counterparts. You know, here in Oregon, there is a massive following around this case. There are thousands of people literally that come out, like whenever there's a hearing and cheer and wave signs and like that is really empowering for the, the plaintiffs, you know, to get that back because they make a lot of sacrifices to, to be in this um, Jane Boitlin, her family has dealt with um, a lot of harassment, death threats, uh, negative um, social experiences. Her, uh, she lost her best friend over joining a lawsuit. So she lives pretty deep in oil country, or she did at the time. She doesn't live there anymore. Um, it wasn't a very welcoming place for her. And when you roll that up with the climate impact she was experiencing, I think it became an easy decision to leave. Her mom is also an activist um, and really active in challenging the Bayou Bridge um, pipeline, which is the other end of the Dakota Access pipeline that, that caused the uh, standoff at Standing Rock. So, um, you know, it, it was a politically charged environment for the whole family. Um, Nathan Baring lives in Alaska and, and has to kind of walk that line of, um, you know, being the climate kid in Alaska and does so, I will say, very gracefully. Um, that, that young man is an example of um, how, to, how to speak to people from your own place, you know, and how to, how to build bridges and, and 
um, he he has no anger uh, in his delivery, and I, I just think it's he really is a wonderful example of of how to talk about these issues in mixed crowds. I think Chitezka Martinez does really good with that as well. Um, but yeah, it totally matters. I mean, we are um, pretty culturally divided in America. We see the the red and blue map, and I would say that's about how it went in this case for the plaintiffs. Right. Um, we have a question in the comments from Madeline who says, um, I agree that it can be disempowering to youth organizers to frame the situation as, okay, now y'all fix this mess because you'll be around in the decades to come. What do you think is a more empowering framework that adult allies can use when working with youth? Yeah, um, you know, I'm just going to parrot something that Shutezkat said to me, and he is, um, he's been the youth director, was the youth director for Earth Guardians for a really long time. So um, he's got a lot of experience with organizing. And at one point um, in writing this project, he said, you know, the fight takes everybody and, and everybody's just got to show up and bring whatever skill they have. And maybe it's not you know, public speaking, maybe it's not being a plaintiff in a federal lawsuit. Um, maybe you're an architect and you want to spend some time designing better buildings for the future. Or maybe um, you're a musician and you want to create lyrics that have meaning around some of this. It, everybody has their own um, values and their own skills that they can bring. And, and um, his suggestion was you know, that to just put yourself in it and, and, and try to um, contribute something in solidarity with the young people, uh, whatever it is that, ha that, that you can. And I would say from my own experience, I unfortunately, I mean, I covered this case, but I also covered the um, youth climate movement a little more broadly. And I've had some really interesting experiences with young um, plaintiffs who, um, sometimes are met with um, uh, mockery and open disdain from older family members who think that um, environmental advocacy is a phase um, or in some kind of childish uh, pastime. And it is life and death for a lot of these young people. And that kind of language has caused, I think, permanent fractures in families with young people who are really, really unsupported. So watch out for that one. I mean, it sounds like, um, you know, this is a question about empowerment, so it's probably not going to go there um, for anyone in, in this group. But it, it really is, it's a really sad thing to, to see. I have had kids say things to me like, um, I, I think I still love my grandparents, but they don't believe in climate change and they don't listen to me. That sucks. Yeah. I think one, I would add one more piece to that, having worked with youth on, on these issues before, I try and remind myself as an attorney that my job really is to be an advocate and a counselor. And in the counselor role, I think of it as being a technical assistance provider. The youth really know what they want to see. They want to see a future that is not, you know, floods, droughts, melted ice caps, degraded environments, no snow, no ability for competitive skiing. The, the things that they've got that they that are outlined in this book are very, very concrete. These are the these are the things that they want to see happen in their world, the changes they want to see. And so I think as adults, we can either be a force that's actively squashing them, such as what Lee was just describing. Or unfortunately, we could stand in the way and try and tell them, no, that's not what you want. What you want is this. And in that case, we're actually, as adults, um, taking on a role of, of, of hierarchy. I really think that when it comes right down to it, one of the things that's really interesting to me is we've created a problem that is based on past activity combined with present inaction and present action there's there's there are actions every day that are being taken that are making this problem more difficult to solve and so the impacts are really on future generations and that really is where the youth i think are the bridge and we should be looking to them to guide us and let those of us who are older and have some role to play there to try and be supportive of their goals and ambitions and dreams and in a way of trying to be uh, i like to say on 
on tap, not on top. I'm a technical assistance provider. I'm not the boss telling you what you need to do. And I think that gets to your earlier point, Lee, about stage managing. You know, there is a sense that uh, many people are not taking the youth seriously because they sort of want to put them into the mode of a being a sock puppet. Like these are all just PR <laughs> moves, but I haven't met such youth activists yet. I know when Greta Thunberg came on the scene, there was a lot of pushback on that. But if you listen to her and see her tell her story, it's very clear that she's speaking from a deep place in her own heart. Um, so I, I think it's important for us just in terms of how can we as adults um, be helpful is to listen more than anything, to sit in with, with the youth and then to think, are there resources that we can help them bring to bear? And some of that might be wisdom. So it might be saying, well, my grandparents think I'm crazy too. Um, you know, I mean, there, there are things we could say too, you know, some of us have had that experience before ourselves. Um, so there's things like that we can do, but the most important thing is to not speak down to them and not, uh, not try and control it. They, their concern and, and anxiety is legitimate and real. And uh, it's one that I share. And so, uh, and, and the science would back them up. So it does seem to me that it's our responsibility, um, those of us who have had a little more experience in these matters, to try and find ways to, to be on tap, not on top. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Um, okay, we have a question from Ruth who says, would you share your thoughts about whether there are aspects of your book that could serve as a vehicle to teach local high school environmental science students about youth efforts uh, to make inroads into legal arguments about climate change? Some of my students are very much on board with the sense of climate urgency and some are not. Do you know anything about youth legal activity? Um. Am I understanding? I'm sorry, I had to plug in my computer before it first out. No, you're fine. So basically, what what are parts of your book that could be shared with um, high school environmental science students who some are aware of climate urgency, some are not, and if you know anything about the legal fight, uh, what would be the best way to share this with them? I mean, probably the whole thing, you know, because it is other young, it is about other young people claiming, you know, claiming their, um, their rights to, to be vocal about this issue. And um, I have gotten actually quite a few questions about this as a curriculum book. Um, and I know a couple, two, three college classes are teaching it already. And I, I don't, I can't recall if we've had any high schoolers reading quite yet, um, but I think I, I like to think the book is fairly accessible. Like, I don't think it's written um, too densely, um, but certainly the um, the experiences. So it's because it is kind of broken into some sections that deal with um particular issues in the context of a plaintiff's story. Um, th there are very many passages that don't include a plaintiff's story. There are some, but I would say um, having, you know, a young person's voice kind of wrap around these issues makes it um, pretty, I think, pretty accessible for a younger person to read. But I, I mean, I'm not entirely sure. You might try it out on a on a young person. I did have two um, sensitivity readers, but they were both in their early twenties, so I think they were both about twenty reading. Um, so maybe just slightly older than than your folks, but I I like to think there isn't too much difference there. Yeah. Um, thanks for answering that question. I think that this would be a great book to share with young people, um, if only just to expose them to some of the legal action that their peers are taking. Um, any other questions? Um, I have one more question, if you don't mind. Um, I like to stay engaged with um, you know, the, the fight against climate change, and that's something that I care really deeply about, but it's also something that 
creates a lot of anxiety and feelings of um, burnout in my life. Um, and as somebody who spent a lot of time engaged with this, um, this challenge and this struggle, both of you, um, if you have any like tips that you feel comfortable sharing about how to sort of power through that, that would be great. <laughs> I find writing helps me power through it. There's a difference for me between being engaged with this as a person, as a, a concern and an emotional issue, and like being engaged with it as a journalist, because if I'm writing about it, then I'm actively doing something. Um, so just that feeling like I'm participating in the way that I know how and can, and that's, um, you know, hopefully uh, important to, to, you know, inching this cause along. I think that that helps me tons. And I also try really hard to separate myself as an individual from the more systemic problems that are around me. Cause I think you could drive yourself absolutely nuts just thinking about like, everything that you do and the climate impacts of like using hot water to wash the dishes for five minutes. You know, there's so much when you really understand the issue that could be um, broken down inch by inch all day, every day into just an itinerary of crazy making. And I, <laughs> I would encourage folks to just really concentrate on systemic problems. It's really helpful to know, and this doesn't excuse us all, but that um, if all of us did everything we could, made all the changes that we could in our individual lives and that solar panels and EVs and everything that we could afford in the fight, Everybody in the world doing this would only make about 2% or 3% difference in the actual carbon footprint of the world. It's these larger systemic issues that have to do with energy and deforestation and so forth that um, are the biggest issues. So maybe just keeping the frame there is also helpful. I would add the two, two, two observations. One is, um, I guess we have to say to ourselves about what is our life going to be spent? My, my view is that life is about struggle and about flourishing and all flourishing is mutual. Um, and we have an opportunity here, I think, in our, in our communities to think about this as something that is our community responsibility, as opposed to, I would call it, um, ecological moralism, personal ecological morality, you know, is your, um, is every clothing choice that you have, is every decision that you make completely going to fix this? No, systemic problems are the real issue here. And part of that is understanding how these systems are set up and what they incentivize. Um, many of our very large investor-owned utilities would appear to be selling electricity. Really, they're selling construction projects. I mean, that's the money they make is actually on large construction projects. Electricity, yes, you get the bill, but it's really not about selling you the electricity. It's about selling the utilities commission on the need to build a new plant. And that's also true with pipelines, by the way. You're not really that interested necessarily in selling gas. Gas has a low profit margin. Pipelines, however, have a good high profit margin, very, very guaranteed. So a lot of these projects that we've spent a lot of time focused on, I think, in this litigation and the United States um, government has been encouraging, you know, the deep water exploration of oil and gas, the large infrastructure of pipelines that are, are transporting it and the other transportation barges. All of us have been subsidizing that at, through our tax dollars uh, and through avoided tax payment. There's tax preferences in our tax system that allow royalties, for example, um, from uh, royalties or payments are supposed to be made to those of us who own the land, that is as taxpayers. The offshore oil uh, in the United States is the U.S. taxpayer's asset. They get discounts on that off of market. And that money then is money that is helping to encourage all of this destruction while simultaneously not being able or not being available for other things. And it's also keeping the price of fossil fuels um, lower than the actual cost of production. These are really big issues. Um, and I think one of the problems that we face is that um, it, the biz some parts of journalism are bifurcated. So you have a business desk 
and an environment desk. Um, one of the things I like about someone like Lee is that she's able to help bridge those two and understand it. Because if you really don't understand how the business piece of this is going on, some of these decisions really don't make any sense. But if you start for a minute, you just say, well, actually, really what they want to do is build pipelines because they get 10 percent rate of return. And so the longer the pipeline, the bigger the profit. Um, then also you're like, oh, OK, well, now it makes sense as to why we're having a pipeline that goes you know, the entire length of the United States um, <laughs> and because every mile is an additional profit. So sorry to get on my soapbox there, but I do think that all of us uh, have an opportunity in our communities to engage. Um, but we also do, I think, have to think about the bigger systems in which we operate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> that is a good answer. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. So, oh, actually, one more. Um, do you have any stories in which the young people started to understand the big picture, financial drivers and motivators, perhaps in ways that we don't think kids can get those big systems? So, yeah. Do you have any stories of kids sort of grasping that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I met Jaden Foytland in Louisiana, just being on uh, her, her mom took me out to the, the swamp to see where the end of the bi bridge pipeline would would uh, terminate and um, the construction going on there in that natural area, which is really pristine. And I, <laughs> we came around a, quarter, a corner in this very quiet, very amazing swamp just dripping with moss and cypress and like into this barge of like guys in orange vests and hard hats and I um and I said what do you think when you see that and she said oh well those are just temporary jobs and started explaining to me how uh most of the people that work on pipelines come from Texas and don't look and she broke it down and, and I was really surprised. She's 15 years old. And, and when I went back to do the research, I mean, she had completely nailed it. So, yeah, um, that's chapter four <laughs> in my book. You can see that one on spool. But absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, it was a good reminder talking to these young people how much, um, you know, they're smart and they get it. If you explain it to them, they get it. Or if they've read it, they get it. And as we get older, I think we complicate things that are um, maybe black and white from the beginning. Mm. Yeah. Great point. Yeah, well, um, thank you guys. Sorry. Thank you guys so much for your time. Um, we're going to wrap up. I just like to end with a few quick reminders. So if you'd like to order a copy of As the World Burns from Flyleaf, you can click the link below our faces. Um, our whole discussion tonight has been recorded and will be available at the same link. So as soon as we wrap up, the page will refresh and you'll be able to access the video. So if you missed some or you want to share with somebody, feel free to pass along that link. Um, and then again, please check out our Crowdcast profile to see our upcoming events. We're constantly adding new ones so you can subscribe and get um, notifications when new ones are posted. I hope to see y'all at some of those future conversations. And again, thank you so much to Lee and Reich. This has been a super fascinating conversation and I really appreciate your time. Thank, thank you, you to Tony. everyone for coming and, and thanks to you both for co-hosting. This was great. Thank was you. Great. Have a good night. Bye.